Hi, everybody, and welcome to Basic Black. You know, some of you are joining us on our broadcast, and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Crystal Haynes, your host for this evening. Callie Crossley is off. Tonight, we're talking about affordable housing. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We're working with limited staff, and our guests are joining us remotely. About 65% of people living in Boston are renters, according to the city of Boston's website. That's with residents paying upwards of 30% of their income going towards rent. So if you're looking to buy a home, home ownership by people of color is very low. In fact, about 30% of African Americans and 17% of Latin residents own their own homes. Black and brown residents are opting out, leaving the city for neighboring or gateway cities to find an affordable place to live. Affordable housing and home ownership is a really big issue. Mayor Michelle Wu, in fact, recently put together an advisory committee to look at housing conditions and rent stabilizations. So what can be done to help communities of color find affordable housing in the city and how can they achieve the dream of owning a home? Joining us remotely is Emilio Dorsley, the CEO of Urban Edge in Roxbury and a member of Boston's Rent Stabilization Advisory Committee. Malia Lazu, CEO and founder of the Lazu Group and lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. And John Cruz III, president and CEO of Cruz Companies in Roxbury. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. So first, I mean, let's jump right on in. In the summer of 2021, we know that Boston saw a historic building boom uh, during the seven years that former Mayor Marty Walsh and a construction union leader. And uh, responsible development, first and foremost, is about doing right by our people. That was a quote from Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. What's your view in Boston's building boom? And I want to start with John here. Well, again, for contractors like ourselves and developers like ourselves, it's been a boom few years. Um, so it's great if you're a contractor or developer, um, except finding help nowadays, whether you're a contractor or, or in the construction development business, um, our hardest, one of our hardest problems is finding people uh, to bring into the industry and if someone leaves to train. Um, the unfortunate part of that equation is that the prices have risen dramatically over the last few years and the supply of housing, whether it's rental or for sale, has gone down on availability and up on the prices. It's causing gentrification in Boston like I never thought I'd see and wasn't close to it before. Uh, my biggest remembrance of gentrifications is the South End, which happened when I was in high school, but I guess I wasn't really close enough to it to realize the effect on this one right here. Um, it is devastating the effect of uh, what it's done to the affordable market for people that want to either buy or rent. Mm. Amilu, you're part of this uh, group, of this uh, advisory committee. What do you what do you say about you know delivering on this promise when we're talking about a building boom? Sure. You know, I would like to agree with John. I think he, you know, he said it correctly that this building boom has been going on for a number of years, and some of it is because that um, Boston has seen an increase in the number of residents who live here. And Boston has a very diverse economy, which I think has attracted a lot of younger, more affluent individuals. But when you think about affordable housing in particular, and especially when it comes to rental and um, home ownership opportunities, what we're seeing is that, um, just using a specific example, we have one particular project that we are completing on Amory Street, um, you know, right down the street from Roxbury, from the uh, Jackson Square T. Mm. And we received over 3,000 applications for 62 units. Mm. It gives you an idea of what the enormity of the need um, that currently exists. Uh, another example 
is that Urban Edge um, also has created, in partnership with Linda Champion, um, a brokerage firm where we have a group of, of, of sales folks who work with individuals of low to moderate income who are looking to purchase homes. And what we've seen using 21, 2021 data is that out of about 23 individuals that we that were in Boston that wanted to purchase, only 11 of them were able to find something that they could afford, while the remaining um, made a choice to buy outside of Boston. And it kind of brings to light what you know, a, you know, a phrase that you know many people use: "Drive till you qualify." Mm. And it's really putting a strain on folks. And I think that trying to figure out how to deliver a more affordable home ownership, not just because it provides quality of life, but it's also an opportunity to build intergenerational wealth. Mm. Emily, I'd love you to jump in here because I know that this is right in your wheelhouse here as you helped so many folks, you know, through that financing process when you were you were in your banking sector there. Yes. I mean, when you look at accessibility to mortgages, friendly mortgages, you know, I mean, Ur Urban Edge can t can tell you um, as much as, you know, as much as I can that the capital doesn't flow traditionally, right? And that also makes it hard for, for people to be able to qualify. Um, and I think this idea of affordable housing is so critical because we're also looking at affordability for different levels, right? So you want affordability for working class families, but you also want affordability for young professional families, mm -hmm. right? We, we want everyone staying in Boston. That That's the richness of Boston is that we had the you know, elite institutions alongside working class, you know, thriving unions. And, and that that's really what we want to figure out how to how to do. And, um, you know, I think what Emilio and John are talking about um, offers the opportunity, we are in this boom, right? So what's a better time to protect working class people than a time where everyone's, you know, everyone's building. And, and I'm very proud that Michelle ran on this platform. Um, you know, she definitely won by a mandate. And I hope that gives the stabilization committee that Emilio is on and um, other people some cover to actually move the needle um, and, and not just, um, you know, you know, not just play to, to the language. I live in Roxbury. I actually live across the street from one of your complexes, John. Um, <laughs> and I'm seeing, and like, I'm, you know, our, our neighborhood, we're not competing with the people who are really living here. I feel like I'm competing with kids' parents mm. um, for, you know, for space. And, and it's just a weird thing to see you being gentrified by college students. It, it's a really weird feeling when you're a grown adult working really hard. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I do want to ask all three of you this. You know, the conversation has always moved toward, you know, build, baby, build. Build as many units as we can, as fast as we can, and that's how we get out of this issue of affordable housing. Is that really the solution, or do we need to think of this as more of a complex problem? Oh, it's a complex, you know, because it costs so much to build. Um, in Boston and places like Boston. And now with the pandemic, uh, probably in some cases, material has gone up 100% like in lumber than it was a year, year and a half ago. So the, the problem is the cost to build. So if it's going to cost you more to build, if you want to serve the under uh, class, I don't mean in, in the class way, but people that don't make, say, 140% of the medium income, you're going to have to subsidize that in one way or another. There's no magic to it. They can't afford the high prices. The prices are theirs because that's what it costs. So somebody has to come in with a subsidy and a deeper subsidy than what has traditionally been done in the past um, in order to level the playing field a little. Sure. I'd like to just follow up on yeah, what John sure. did, especially around the subsidy. You know, you know, for most people who may not be familiar with affordable housing, that you know, building a market rate building and building an affordable building, um, they're pretty much the same process. Uh, mm -hmm. The cost, as John said, are the same. What's different is that affordable housing is able to receive subsidy from the federal, state, and local levels that allow 
um, the developers to rent the units within an income restricted range that allows it to be affordable to a larger range of people. So as John said, um, in order for more affordable housing to be built, there needs to be uh, significantly more money available um, for subsidy so that people can develop. The other challenge is that as the cost of land increases in Boston, it also increases the cost of doing affordable housing because you can't simply pass that cost on to the end user, which is the renter, the way that market developers do. Well, I want to ask you that uh, on that point, Emilio. You know, we have these IDPs and programs uh, in the city of Boston that are basically there to check large developers from just sort of buying out or paying out so that they don't have to have affordable units, units because it is about the return on your investment, too, when you're talking about development. So do we need to have stricter regulation on that end, raising that percentage of IDP so that uh, there is a bigger incentive for developers to create more units of affordable housing. Like when a luxury apartment complex goes up, more than 10 units need to be affordable. Sure. No, I think this is a discussion that is currently already happening. And I know that there's been some proposals in the city council and from the mayor around trying to figure out how to use some of the existing um, programs to increase um, the amount that is contributed and then utilized and available for um, subsidies for affordable housing. I think that, you, you know, when you look at different cities, around the country. And I think it's also important to put in context what's happening here in Boston is unique in its own way, but it's happening in many, many other urban areas. And so the question is, how do you balance it in a way so that you're not depressing the need for people who want to do development, but still meeting the need? I mean, some folks do, um, in some cities, they do 80-20. Uh, 80 percent has to be affordable of every project or or certain type of project. And so I think that that's a conversation that really needs to be had, because at the rate that we're going, um, we're not going to really meet the housing needs of both people who are already here, but also the projected new residents that are going to be moving to Boston over the next several years. Mm. Yeah. Let's jump in there, Crystal, and um, you know, just say that. I think it's an opportunity for private developers to really look at what their business model is for the 21st century, right? And what we know is that they're needing to make changes around diversity, right? And that the mass port model is forcing changes. And what it's bringing is really incredible opportunities, right? To either encourage black business here um, or partner with investors and developers across the country. And that's really exciting for Boston. And I think what developers are slowly coming to realize is that people are going to pay for culture. Mm. And if you want to become the next Brooklyn, the next cool thing, the last thing you can become is the seaport, mm. right? And, and so I think what developers, you know, maybe want to go back and, you know, reread Jane Jacobs and, and remember what it actually takes to build a vibrant neighborhood in a vibrant city. And once you see that, you can actually put a different value on affordable housing, because just like people are looking at retail differently now, right, and saying we need those cool businesses, so we're not just going to go after the AAA, you know, credit rating, right? We're going to work with folks so we can get in rhythm wraps, so we can get in trail fit. Um, we're going to be doing the same thing with housing because these Zoomers and these next generation, they don't want to live in a segregated town that their, you know, that their parents may have grew, grown up in. Um, and so, you know, I think it does give um, real estate developers an opportunity to build a business model that'll actually be reflective of the 21st century and not have them getting beat up every time they go for a permit. Well, my other thing, which I thought was very interesting in doing the research of this show, was Brockton, for the first time in its history, is a majority black 
community, making it the only New England city in New of its kind here. So in 2017, Brockton accounted for one in five home loans in to black homeowners in Massachusetts. So I'm interested about, you know, Malia, you're talking about, you know, folks are going to pay for culture. Like they may, Boston may no longer be attractive to people of color if we develop what is unique and rich about it out of it. And so I'm interested in this, meaning what is your view when people of color leave Boston to settle in gateway cities? Because they're like, listen, that place, that restaurant I like, that shop I like, that bookstore I like, that's over here in Brockton. That's not in the seaport or even in Roxbury mm -hmm. anymore. Or even in Roxbury anymore, right? And and that's really when, when you look at you know, cycles of, I mean, in so many ways, right, we're housing refugees, right? Mm. We have to, as Emilio said, we have to drive until we're qualified, right? Um, and so when we get to a place, we create it, right? We create our culture. We open up our restaurants. We open up our bookstores. We we do that, and we do that with sawdust and spit, yep. right? Let's be clear, right? We, we can do it with very little. And then it becomes cool. And then the people from the seaport now want to move to Brockton and then we get a chance to move back to Boston, right? And and that's, you know, the, the cycle that, that that you see of housing in so many areas. And so, you know, I think we are going to see that, right? I think, you know, I are, I know I'm already going to Hyde Park, Park more than I've ever gone to <laughs> in my life. You know, I was like, Hyde Park, why are we, right? And we, we are Quincy. I mean, we're going to Quincy now, right? We're going to be going to Brockton soon, Worcester. Um, and so, we will be building those gateway cities and they'll be full and they'll be vibrant. And I hope that the city councilors and the mayors of those cities protect that, mm -hmm. right? And understand that they're getting an opportunity to actually compete with Boston in a real way. Um, and they should lean into that and lean into the economies they'll be building. Emilio and John, what, what are your thoughts about folks, you know, going to these gateway cities? Yeah, well, that's a, a two, two, I'm sorry, Emily. Go ahead and I'll call next. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, John, that's a, a conversation we often have at Urban Edge because we are committed to helping both our residents and uh, community members really become first time home buyers. You know, on average, every year we have, well, actually, just this past year, um, 2021, we had over 800 individuals uh, take off first time home buying class. But the problem is that we want to keep people in Boston, mm. but the market and the intensity of, of, you know, of home buying really makes it difficult. And so it becomes this difficult choice between people having an opportunity to build an intergenerational wealth by becoming a, a, a homeowner in a gateway city or in another city versus staying in Boston, which is where many of them would like. Some people do choose to go to Brockton or Randolph just because they want something different. But a significant number of people want to stay. And there's a political aspect to this is that as we begin to shift, um, especially when you see who's in elected office mm. and who votes for them, so there is something to be said that the value of keeping people in Boston goes far beyond um, just the cultural, which I think is incredibly important, but it also has a political component of making sure that you have voters of a diverse background who can continue to live in the neighborhoods that they grew up in. John, well, there was something you wanted I to add. From my perspective, I, uh, again, am a for-profit, developer, not a nonprofit, but costs affect both. I mean, we both have to deal with the rising costs that uh, makes Boston more difficult to develop in. We're now doing something, we've done something before, but we're moving out. We're going to be doing one or two projects in New Bedford. Why? The land is a lot cheaper. Brockton, the land is a lot cheaper. Um, so it makes it easier for us to make the numbers work. So a lot of developers are moving because it's so hard to make a deal pencil out in Boston, whether it's a condo, it may pencil out, but the neighborhood isn't going to afford it. So you're going to cause gentrification. In our case, for affordable housing, it's hard to make the numbers work in Boston now just to do affordable housing. So we're moving out, I know other developers are, to the suburbs where it's not 
so expensive to build. The other thing is you mentioned uh, gentrification and not only comes from uh, white people buying a home to live in Roxbury, it comes from the developers now that are rehabbing these houses for students and renting them out to students. Um, and, you know, you, people come home and there's party going on in their, their streets that they grew up on and uh, it's not them. So th th there's a little of that culture uh, pushback. I think that people are, are angry to lose what they once considered there is. So then if the land value and price is the particular issue here, is the solution to then legislate it to keep it affordable where we can get the housing for so that folks can stay in their generational home? Is the answer on Beacon Hill, I guess, is my question. To either I of think, you all, yeah. I think it is, but um, you don't want to punish the economy um, and make things slow down, or you don't want to punish the um, developer. You want to make sure that they develop with homogenized housing where it doesn't re restrict it to one class. Um, and that, again, I'll get back to is going to take some sort of a paradigm shift in the way the city views, views housing. It's gotta come, we're at a point right now, we're trying to push a square peg in a round hole. Mm. It's gotta take some changes from the legislature or other initiative programs that are different than the ones that whether it's Urban Edge or us, we go to the pot of what is available to build housing that part has to be filled up right now. It's not filled up. There's a gap. And so that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it would be really challenging to figure out how to create legislation that would artificially suppress um, the cost of land. Um, but having said that, I, you know, I know that in some cities, um, I don't know if they've tried this for, uh, for, vacant lots or land, but there's been some cities that have developed flip taxes for uh, specific properties. So the idea that people are going in, buying things low, holding it for a few months, and then selling it at a significant increase, that's something I've seen some cities through legislation have been able uh, to begin to deal with. But again, um, you have to look at this as a full picture. I mean, there is the issue of home ownership, but there's also the issue of you know, of rentals. And one of the reasons why the issue of rent stabilization continues to come up and um, and we have to give Mayor Wu credit for not only campaigning on saying that she would be looking into this, but then following through on her campaign promise to actually put this uh, advisory group together mm. because part of it is that people need some predictability especially people with low to moderate income so that on any given year that someone's rent is not increasing by 40, 50 right. or more percent. Right. Um, but at the same time, you have to balance that with the needs of the landlord because as we know, energy costs continue to increase and other costs. And so it's trying to find how do you help to support low to moderate income people who want to stay in Boston and who without some predictability are kind of moving from place to place. And that has impacts on young children and the schools that they attend and their ability to be successful. But it also destabilizes neighborhoods. Mm. And so, you know, I'm really looking forward to, you know, to the advisory group having some really deep conversations. And, and I'm just glad that um, this is something that the mayor has decided that is important enough to bring uh, a really rich, diverse group of people to have this important conversation. In the last two minutes we have on this broadcast space, and Malia, I'm going to have you go first. I mean, what do we see as, in a few words, the the solution moving forward so that folks can stay in Boston and we can keep our culture rich seated in Boston and its neighborhoods. And Malia, I'm going to start with you. And equitable, right? Yeah, we all remember equitable. that eight dollar that that eight dollar stat. Um, I think John said it when he said paradigm shift, right? Part of what we're trying to do is repair 
the horrible exclusion that black and brown people have had from home buying for centuries, right? And so that means that not everyone gets to win the way everyone gets to win right now, right? That there actually needs to be a paradigm shift because we have to repair the harm. So more people have to get, right, in certain areas because we took from them and they deserve that, right? So I think, you know, a paradigm shift there. And then, you know, there there is some answers at the state house. Um, there's answers, you know, I'm glad that we're looking at the BPDA. Um, you know, I think how we can pressure on zoning and incentives, but also colleges have to take responsibility. And I think that there's a real opportunity here for the mayor to, to lean into that and to ensure that we as taxpayers and homeowners in communities like Roxbury um, are not needing to compete with institutions um, like colleges and that they house their, their people and they don't get to make money off of us in so many ways, right, um, with the way that they're doing. So, you know, but if we don't actually shift our thinking and if we don't actually take a reparative approach to this, the developers will always win because that's what capitalism's narrative asks for. Absolutely. And so I want to thank you all for being on the broadcast portion of this. Uh, that's the end of our broadcast and the end of this show. But thank you so much for joining us. But stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much. I'm Crystal Haynes. Everybody, I'm Crystal Haynes, your host for this evening, In for Cali. We are on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing in conversation on affordable housing. And also joining us is Crystal Cornegay. She is the executive director of Mass Housing in Boston. Welcome, welcome to the conversation, Crystal. And of course, we're also here with Emilio Dorsley, CEO of Urban Edge, and Malia Lazouf of the Lazou Group, and of course, John Cruz III of Cruz and Company. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> so we were, uh, we have been having a rich conversation about affordable housing. I want to talk about this money that was infused into the housing market to support folks who are renters. Governor Charlie Baker's administration, they had announced federally funding pandemic rental assistance that's going to end this month. The program itself, for folks who may not know, actually granted more than $400 million in rental assistance. So in each of your opinions, how will renters cope without the support? And Crystal, I want to start with you. Great. Um, one of the thank you first, thank you for having me. And hello to my friends who are in the other boxes. Um, I will say first, the thing to know about Massachusetts is that it already had a program to help renters who were behind in their rent uh, called, um, uh, it, the acronym is RAFT and in the, at the moment I can't remember what it was for. And so that program in the upcoming budget um, will be increased. And so there will be increased resources, um, not at the levels that they were at the, at the uh, when the feds were here. And so it's not like that program is gonna go away and then there are no resources for renters whatsoever. In addition, to, in addition to that, the new state budget calls for an increase in the state's um, rental voucher program so that people can have access to those things as well. Um, is that gonna help everybody? No. Um, and so we have to think clearly um, about um, the folks who it may or may not help and how we get resources for, for available for those folks. Yeah, because we know with RAFT, some folks have a hard time accessing it. And I know that the access has been has been a big issue, especially in the pandemic where other resources are limited to get folks to what they need. 
Yeah, um, as a, we, the state had heard all of that um, and created a central portal system, mass housing and the mass housing partnership uh, worked together with the Department of Housing and Community Develop to do a program that really allowed owners to apply on behalf of um, renters because owners have a bunch of the information that one needs in order to um, you know, apply for the assistance. And so we created this uh, portal for owners to do that and uh, push through um, over $20 million to help owners directly uh, help renters so that uh, the, the burden wasn't only on the renter to come up with the individual pieces of paper. Mm. Emilio, uh, you know, you are on uh, this committee with the, in the city of Boston. When this federal money is gone, is there going to be a concern about affordable housing and how can the city address that directly? Sure. First, I want to thank Crystal for talking about the rental assistance because Urban Edge participated in the SHERA program and were able to help a number of residents apply and receive some relief from some of the uh, back payments that they owed. Um, you know, it's going to be a big challenge because obviously with more money, you're able to do more things and support more uh, needs. But I think it goes back to what Malia was saying is that this paradigm shift is really what's needed. Because if we are always looking at um, limited resources and trying to figure out what issues, which communities, which concerns are most important and we don't have the paradigm shift where we're looking at low to moderate income communities and communities of color as a vital part of the state, of the city, then we're not going to be able to use the dollars we have in the most effective way that we can. And so I think the, the first step is, and this is why when I talk about keeping people in Boston, even though I think that, you know, we believe in choice, people should choose to, you know, to buy wherever they can afford. But the political nature of having communities organized so, so that they can advocate for where they think the funds are needed the most and to have our elected officials listen to us and then follow through on what communities are saying. And I think that's probably going to be the first step because you know, the federal dollars are great, and I believe over the next several years, they're going to really have a great impact. But as you said, at some point, <laughs> they're not going to be available anymore. Mm. Malia, and we need to start thinking what comes next. Yeah. Malia, jump in here. Yeah, I was just taking a note. I mean, I think what, you know, we're highlighting, and I think we also saw it with um, the North End conversation, right, is that the mayor is needing to balance the desires of the voters um, with the desires and plans that other folks have who don't live in the city, but contribute to the city's economy in different ways, right? And and that, that's a really interesting tension to be in. Um, you know, I wrote a column for Banker and Tradesman um, right after this saying, you know, I hope developers respond right? And understand that what the city of Boston is asking for is a different type of development. Mm. And that's how they want to do business with developers. And that was clear with the vote because Anissa tried and they gave her a lot of money to try, <laughs> right? And so, you know, these folks don't necessarily live in Boston. They don't necessarily, they come here to, again, enjoy the vibrancy. Um, but they, you know, they need to understand that part of that is respecting the people who live here now and the path forward they would like to have. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm excited about the, the opportunity we have because of what we were able to do with that vote. We were talking about... Uh you know, during the broadcast about this idea of home ownership, especially for folks of color and how this has been very difficult to attain for so many. And we talked about solutions there. I'm interested in how is, does financial literacy need to be baked into more levels of our institutions in order to make home ownership possible for folks of color? So I'm gonna jump in and yeah. I, I may have a different perspective than others. I don't think financial literacy is something we actually need. Mm. I, I think that 
single mothers know how to get through their paychecks, right? Um, I think that working class whites get mortgages, right? So I think this idea that we don't understand it and that's why we don't have access to it is a false narrative. Right. The fact of the matter is, is that after World War II, white folks got access to the GI Bill that helped them, you know, that helped working class whites get on their way to middle class them. We did not get that. Right. So now we're going to banks now after redlining. Right. I mean, we can go through all the decades. Right. But just quickly, we got screwed. We got screwed. We got screwed. And now we're here and we're trying to get included. Right. Um, and what we need to understand is that we're not getting mortgages because of the systemic racism in how we give out debt. So when you look at the five C's, right, there's things like collateral. Well, if I have historically stolen your wealth and then I say you need to have collateral in order to get a loan from me, I'm setting you up for failure, right? I'm actually saying you need the one thing that I've taken from you in order to play here. And you can go down the five C's and see each one. Um, and that's really what makes character-based lending so important, you know? So when it comes to mortgages getting on the road, mm -hmm. I don't think it's our fault at all. Yeah. And I don't think there's nothing that we don't know. What I think is that there's systemic racism in debt and how debt is given by traditional banks. And we see 50% of black and brown people being underbanked versus 19% of whites. So you know it's not a class thing. Right. Crystal, jump in here as you work. Sure. Here. I Yeah. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things, one of which is we have, just to go back around a paradigm shift, right? So when we talk about eviction prevention, we create the narrative that the tension is between the landlord and the tenant, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and really, the tension is higher up. Right. It's the investor and the guy who has the mortgage. Right. Because no one's telling those group of peoples that they have to get less. No one is telling the insurance companies that they have to get less. No one is telling the real estate taxes that they have to get less. They, they, they're leaving this tension down on the ground. Uh, between the tenant and the landlord. And there's nowhere for them to go except to vilify each other. Right. And or to the government and say, you got to help us. Well, some of what the government can do is create an environment in which the investors, uh, Fannie and Freddie, can figure out how to take a little bit of a hit hmm. or, you know, or what they did was extend the mortgage and that kind of thing. And so to Malia's point, home ownership is a thing in which it's systemic. Right. And so there are big systemic problems. And so we um, we help. Uh, uh, spearhead this program that we call the Commonwealth Builder, which is really about home ownership production, right, in, in gateway cities and Boston. And people say, well, why gateway cities? Well, we looked at the data and saw that that's where people of color were buying, and that's yeah. where people of color live, and that there was no home ownership production really happening in those places. You can get affordable rental housing happening in those places all day long and twice on Sunday, right? But no home ownership production. Mm -hmm. And so we we said that's where we were going to go. And it became it became a really big thing. We said we were going to think differently about the deed restriction, right? Because the wealth building was important. And, you know, and there's a lot of concern around that kind of thing. I, I, I say to people often, it's like, until we get to the system change, we got to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, we're not going to sit here and say, you know, I'm not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Mm -hmm. And I want a lot of, I want as many people of color as we can to get into a home as, as you know, and help it be sustainable. There are, there are good products in which that can happen. And, you know, feel free to call Mass Housing and, um, you know, we will lead you down that path. And John, um, I want to give you the last word here. Well, uh, again, I almost started to say that before the segment Crystal was on, but I didn't want to steal her thunder. But I just want to say kudos and kudos and paradigm shift. Mass housing has already started the paradigm shift where that commonwealth builder is kudos. Yes, we need more money. We need to fund it more. But that's making a significant uh, dent in affordable housing for sale 
we're actually using that on a program in Nubian Square where we're having both rental, low income and for sale. And the for sale is made possible through the Commonwealth Builder Program and about 30%, maybe a little under of the 110 condos that we're doing are gonna be affordable. That's the first time. Just think if that happened 10 times. Right. Yes, we right. may have some problems, but we surely wouldn't be looking at deficit, the big gap that we have now on who can afford it. So that program has to be repeated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us here for this after uh, after sh post show uh, here on Facebook. Uh, I'm Crystal Haynes. I am here with Malia Lazu of the Lazu Group, Emilio Dorsley of CEO of Urban Edge, Crystal Cornegay. For, she's the executive director of Mass Housing and John Cruz of Cruz Companies. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.